come in. Welcome. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. A savage place as holy as enchanted as air beneath the waning moon was haunted by a woman wailing for her demon lover. A woman wailing for her demon lover. How poignant. How poignant the way the poet puts it. But are there demon lovers? And are there women who will fall in love with them? Surely this is the stuff of legend and myth. And yet, there are things that simply cannot be explained. You mean we shall actually see the tiger from up here in the tree? Yes, and I shall shoot him as he passes below. But why should he pass by here? Well, he's after the goat. The one down there. Oh, poor creature. Why doesn't he run away? We can't. He's tied to a stake in the ground. But the tiger will kill him. An unfortunate necessity. Oh, no. Oh, no. I shall not permit it. Louise, where are you going? I intend to free that Louise, goat. Louise, you can't go down there. Come back here. Louise! <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Love God, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Marion Seldes and Court Benson. I shall be back shortly with Act One. East is East and west is west, and never the twain shall meet. So said Mr. Kipling. But he knew better than that, because it did meet for many years in that vast, mysterious universe of a country called India. India with its kaleidoscope of religions, races, and languages. India where there is so much myth and so much reality. This is a story that took place at a time when India was known as the British Raj. A lady and a gentleman are sitting on a veranda. Uh, did you know that veranda is an Indian word? And they are sipping tea. Cream. Thank you. Sugar. Thank you. Cake. Oh, I shouldn't. But you will. Well, just the thinnest, tiniest uh, sliver. I know what you're up to, Willis. You're afraid to spoil your appetite for dinner. Oh, about dinner. I shall not be having dinner. No? Bahadur Khan. Not having dinner? I'm afraid not. But we've prepared your favorite. I'm afraid it can't be helped. Ah, Bahadur Khan. It is in my mind to hunt this night. See, therefore, that thou wilt prepare the double-barrel express rifle. You're going to hunt this evening? Uh, reports of a man-eating tiger in the Mahura district... Causing no end of a fuss. Oh. The tiger has got to be put a stop to. And you're taking Bahadur Khan with you? Well, of course. But you will be back by Saturday. Yes, one way or another. That's good. I need Bahadur Khan to drive to the railroad station at Maipur. Oh? Yes. To pick up Louise. Louise? I've actually prevailed upon her to come out for a visit. Louise? You remember my friend Louise? The skinny one? Well, she is slender. Pasty-faced? light complexion. Watery eyes. Actually, her eyes are that delicate shade of china blue. Kind of a big woman. Stately. And as I recall, very opinionated. Uh, she does have some rather sincerely held convictions. She's really a lovely person. No doubt. When you get to know her... You don't mind, do you? Well, this is your home as well as mine. Perfectly awful female. Now, Willis, she's a perfectly lovely person. I was talking, my dear, from a masculine point of view. Ah, Bahadur Khan, I shall want the Martin as my second gun. See thee now to the horses. My name is Bahadur Khan. I serve in the house of Willis Foster Sahib. Foster Sahib is the district commissioner. He is wise indeed. In his 40 years of life, 
he has not taken a wife. This does not sit well with his sister Pamela Sahiba, a widow who keeps his home. English Mim Sahibs have a peculiar affliction. They cannot tolerate the sight of a bachelor. I could tell by the sweet notes in Pamela Sahiba's voice and the shining look in her eyes that this Louise Sahiba was her latest candidate to storm the citadel of the fortress that was Foster Sahib's heart. Boy! Does the Mem Sahib deign to speak to one so lowly? Are you... What's your name supposed to be? I've got it written down here. Are you Bahadur Khan? Bahadur Khan, it is. With the permission of the presence. You were supposed to meet me inside the terminal. If the presence will forgive, I was afraid to venture inside the house of the fire carriages. Afraid? What on earth is there to be afraid of? The fire wagon that pulls the tyran. The engine? Inside, it is filled with devils. Devils? Oh, yes. Devils that have been captured by the government and sentenced to boil the water to make steam for the train. I have never heard such nonsense. Angry devils. And sometimes they escape. In their great fury, they will melt the iron of the fire wagon. And there is a terrible explosion and many die. How can you believe such superstitious nonsense? If it offends the presence, I shall not believe it. She was rather large, as Mem Sahibas go, and not at all unshapely. However, her tongue was never silent. A talking woman for Foster Sahib? Never. And so, without a moment of silence, we drove to the house. As we entered the gate, there was something that finally stilled her voice for a moment. What's that? What's that noise? Uh, noise? Can't you hear over there? That man is hitting that woman. Uh, that is so. He's beating her. Put a stop to it. Sahiba, that man is Foster Sahib's gardener, Pierre Khan. Make him stop. He has no right to beat that woman. He has every right. She is his wife. I'll stop him myself. Uh, but, but, Sahiba... Stop that! Oh, 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 I said stop that, you scoundrel! Stop that at once! Poor Pierre Khan. What was he doing but beating his wife? Suddenly he was beset unmercifully with an umbrella. And thus did the Mem Sahib Louise enter the household. I must say she made her presence felt. She was constantly correcting, admonishing, advising. She was having an effect on everyone except, of course, Foster Sahib. He found reasons to work quite late at the office. One day, the two Mem Sahibs were having tea on the veranda. Uh, Louise, dear, I must ask you not to... Uh, uh, to interfere. Interfere? In what way? <laughs> well, the truth is, in every way. Well, I'm sure I don't understand. Uh, since you've come to the station, Louise, you've managed to turn things topsy-turvy, inside out, upside down, and every which way. Have I indeed? Uh, for example, you know, uh, Peter Khan's beating his wife. Oh, I put a stop to that quickly enough. Uh, the point is, you had no right to stop him. And you had no right to belabor him with your umbrella, either. Do you object to my actions, Pamela? I'm afraid, Louise, I must say yes. But the scoundrel was beating her without mercy. You didn't see him abuse that poor girl. Oh, I've seen him. You have? Yes. <laughs> Many times. And you've done nothing to prevent it? There's nothing I can or should do to prevent it. Things are very different out here. Oh, yes. And you're different, too. Why, back home, you were a member of the Fabian Society. Well? Well, I remember you at the meeting when you were asked to speak. Please, Louise. They still talk about that speech, the most inspiring oration on the rights of human beings. Louise, what you fail to understand. Suppose they could be aware of this conversation. What would they say about it back home? 
This is my home now, Louise. My husband is buried here. My children are being raised here. I have no other home. Oh, Pamela, you mustn't think that way. You'd better start thinking that way, too. Oh, no, never. Louise, I asked you to come here because there is no hope for you in England. That isn't true. Then why did you come? That crowd of starry-eyed idealists we ran about with, for the most part, they don't believe in marriage. And those that do, well, they don't believe in... Well, they don't believe in consummating it. Pamela! I saw the way the wind was blowing there ten years ago. So I came here where I could meet someone. It took you somewhat longer, but here you are. Meanwhile, please do not upset my household. What am I doing to upset you? In the you? matter of Pierre Khan and his way, for example, you have given me a problem. You see, he no longer beats her. And that's a problem. Laila is the best cook I've ever had. Now she just sits and mopes all day. Well, why? Because her heart is broken. She believes her husband no longer loves her. Well, why should she think so? Because he no longer beats her. Dear, let us not forget the object of your visit. I know that my brother is a most unusually difficult fish to land. Uh, do you see this charm around my neck? Mm-hmm. Rather somber-looking well, thing. Well, please listen before you say anything. When I came to India ten years ago to live with Willis, Bahadur Khan said to me, Sahiba, here is a token from the god of love, Omira. Omira? There are thousands of such gods. At any rate, he told me, if I wore the charm constantly, within the year I would be married. I did, and I was. Are you telling me that you actually believe in this? What I'm telling you is that a girl needs all the help she can get. And so I uh, took the liberty of asking Bahadur Khan to... Uh, to, uh, to what? Bahadur Khan? You'll see, Louise. Sahiba. Bahadur Khan, hast thou found the charm for the... Mem Sahib, as I asked thee. One who is even less than the dirt beneath the Sahiba's feet has indeed brought that which is desired. Behold. Oh, Louise, look, it is beautiful. Well, what is it supposed to be? It's your charm. You are now under the special graces of the love god, Omira. What are you saying, Pamela? And before the year is out, he shall find you a husband. Here, wear it around your neck. I shall do no such oh, thing. Oh, but Louise... Do you expect me to partake in this superstitious nonsense? To aid, abet, and encourage it? No. Thank you, Bahuda Khan. Pamela, I shall win Willis through intelligence and wit and... and, and all the civilized things we have in common. Such a vain and foolish Mem Sahib. But what is to be done? The English, they are like children. They refuse to learn when they are young, and when they grow old, it is too late. Poor, silly Louise Sahiba. Now, no one shall ever lead her to the marriage bed. I don't know about you, but I agree with Pamela. A woman needs all the help she can get, particularly in the affairs of the heart. So then, what prognosis for this proposed match between Willis and Louise? Can it proceed without help from the love god? Is there a love god? Mystery Theater will continue with Act Two in just a few moments. It is said that marriages and hangings go by destiny, which means that each is foreordained. But destiny, like everything else, 
can always use a push here and there along the line. Well, here we are in the India of over 100 years ago. A determined spinster named Louise has just turned down an offer of help from one of the local love gods. My goodness, you would think it was an offer she couldn't afford to refuse. That will be all bad again. Sahiba. You didn't have to hurt his feelings. You could have accepted the charm. Mm -hmm. And connived at this dark superstition. Oh, Louise, everything doesn't have to be so serious. Well, I think it's high time we adopted a serious attitude towards that heathen mythology. But Hare Khan is quite tolerant about our religion. Can't we extend the same indulgence to his? Really, dear, you shouldn't be so earnest all the time. But life is earnest. Life is real. Yes, yes, I suppose so. Now, um, shall we apply ourselves to the problem at hand? The conquest of Willis? Oh, I wish you wouldn't refer to planning for marriage as a conquest. Conquest? Seduction? <laughs> Call it what you will. I call it a meeting of the mind. It's also a meeting of the body. Two rational, intelligent human beings who can see that their best interests can be served and their better natures enhanced by a union, as it were, of the spiritual aspects. Uh, tell me, what plans have you in mind for Willis? I shall prove to Willis that I am completely interested, not to say fascinated, by his work. Oh, why do women feel they must take an interest in a man's work? Well, to prove that they share. Nonsense. I intend to have a, a partnership with my husband. Uh, what most men have in mind is an ownership, not modern, progressive, enlightened men. Oh, darling, they're the most boring kind. Well, good afternoon. Oh, home early, I see, Willis. Yes, pour me a cup of that tea, please. Bahadur Khan. How are you, Willis? We see so little of you. Uh, well, the uh, work of the empire, the vast, lumbering Indian empire, must be got through somehow. Ah, Bahadur Khan, it is time to settle accounts with the man-eater in the Mahura Hills. Thou wilt fetch the double-barrel rifle and ammunition. It is even as the prison's commands. The second gun and all else that will be required for the hunt. We leave in the morning. Are you going to try for that tiresome tiger again? Oh, well, we'll put an end to him this time. Do you intend to actually shoot and kill a tiger, Willis? With luck. But a tiger? Such a noble, magnificent beast? He's a cattle killer, a man-eater. Aren't you moved by Mr. Blake's poem? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night... What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful cemetery? Oh, not this one. He's old and sick and mangy, half blind and lame. That's why he's become a man-eater, because he's unable to hunt down game. Oh, well, then it's a, a mission of mercy? Well, I suppose you could call it that. Well, then I approve, completely. Well, thank you. And also, I believe I should like to come along. Come along? Well, of course. This is India. The India of the jungle, the true India. But well, it might be dangerous. Dangerous? You said the tiger was half blind and lame. Yes, of course. <laughs> That's what makes him even more dangerous. A half blind, lame tiger? Yes. <laughs> but he's still formidable. Not to be trifled oh, with. Oh, but I should so like to see it. Do let me come. Is there any reason, Willis, why Louise shouldn't go? Well... Then it's settled. <laughs> Come to my room, Louise, and I shall lend you an outfit suitable for tiger hunting. Aren't you the sly one? What do you mean? I'm sure you must know how tigers are hunted. No, really, I haven't the foggiest notion. One uh, sits up all night in a blind and waits. Is that a fact? As if you didn't know. So there you are, the two of you. Alone in the moonlight, with the perfume of the exotic jungle flowers, creating a most seductive... Oh, nonsense. We shall have a most rational discussion to ascertain our common interests. Oh, yes. I was afraid of that. 
And so the three of us rode to the Mayahura Hills, which had sent messages to the district commissioner to rid them of the man-eater who filled entire villages with dread. When we arrived in the foothills, we proceeded on foot, and since these were not our hills, I stopped for a moment and knelt. What's he doing? Shh. We may proceed, if the presence so desires. Lead us, Bahadur Khan. What was he doing? He was asking permission to hunt. Asking permission? From whom? From the guard of this particular jungle. Oh, you see, we're strangers here. <laughs> you speak as if you actually believe in it yourself. <laughs> Does it hurt? I would suppose one is always well advised to have as many things going for one as possible. But to answer your question, yes, it, it hurts. It hurts the cause of progress and enlightenment to support base superstition. Ah, right then, I knew her hopes were doomed. He would never lead her to his marriage bed. For a brief moment, he had been attracted to her. The fact that she wished to hunt the tiger at night had marked her as a woman of spirit. But then, of course, she had spoiled it all with her inability to hold her tongue. Ah, these foolish English. Why do they talk so much? Dost thou hear it, Bahodur Khan? By the favor of the presence, thy servant hears. What is it? A goat. A goat? If it is thy will, I shall go forward to see if the villagers have prepared the blind. What is he saying? We must keep our voices low. What is he saying? The villagers should have built us a platform high up in a tree. Why? Sahib, Sahib, come. Yes, I believe it's in readiness. Up here, Sahib. Good. Help the Mem Sahib up the tree. Oh, thank you very much. Shh. Now come, we must hurry. Ah, Shere Khan hunts this night. Shere Khan, who is that? Well, that's what the natives call the tiger. You know, this is really quite roomy and comfortable. Yes. Now, I have a question. Mm. You can look down from here and shoot the tiger, but <laughs> why should he be good enough to oblige you and pass this way? That's why don't understand. Well, look below. Uh, to the left. What do you see? Seems to be a goat. Exactly. What's he standing there for? Doesn't he hear the tiger? Oh, yes, he does. Well, then why doesn't he run away? Well, he can't. He's tethered to a stake in the ground. Well, why? For what unearthly reason? It's a very sound reason. The villagers put him out here to attract Shere Khan. And when he comes, I'll be able to shoot him. But the poor goat. What about the poor goat? But the tiger will spring on him and kill him. Well, yes, that's the idea of the thing. Well, that's not fair. It's the only way to do it. Are you saying this is the only way to hunt a tiger? The only way without risking the loss of life. But the goat is going to lose its life. I mean human life. Well, the goat is also a child of the creator. Oh, no. I well, I can't tolerate well, this. Making too much noise will scare off the tiger. That poor little goat. Where are you going? I shall not stay here and see that goat be made a victim. You can't go down there. Bahadur the Khan, stop her. Don't you dare. You come back here. I'm going to untie that goat so that it can run away. Now listen. Nice goat. Nice creature. Just let me untie this knot. The tiger is prowling around down there. I can't seem to unloosen this knot. Do you want to get killed? Open. Not. Louise! Jeez. Even if I could see the tiger, I couldn't shoot him in time. It's giving way, it's opening. Louise! Just another moment, that's all I need. Louise! Yeah. Run! You're free! Sorry. Run! Behold! Shut up! You silly little goat! You get away from here, you big bully! Get away! Go home! Shoot him, Sahib! Shoot! How can I shoot that confounded woman standing in the way? Go on now. You heard me. Go home. That's a nice pussy cat. Just turn around and go straight home. You hear me? Go home. Ah. 
Are they not crazy, all these English? On the ground is the mad Mem Sahib, and she is almost twisting the whiskers of the terrible tiger. I do not know which of the two is more frightened. Up in the tree is Foster Sahib with the double barrel rifle, cursing as if the devil is in his mouth, trying to shoot the tiger. But the Mim Sahib is in the line of fire. And also in the tree, we have me, Badur Khan, wandering, waiting to see how, with the grace of God, it will all come out. <laughs> And I am with you, Bahadra Khan, also, waiting and wondering how it must all come out. As we both know, the design has already been woven by providence, and all shall be revealed in the appointed time by revelation, which, in our drama, is always the third act. Who rides a tiger, the proverb tells us, dares not dismount. That's a very good analysis of those who are actually riding the tiger. But what can we say of one who is facing the tiger and alone, unarmed, and on foot? I would suppose we could only remark such a person is hardly a good insurance risk. Oh. Be a nice pussy cat and go straight home. That's right. Go home. <laughs> yes, and goodbye to you too. And don't you dare show your face around here again. Now, Sahib, now shoot him. <laughs> Missed. The other barrel, Sahib. Quickly. Oh, he got away. So he did. And I'm glad. You're glad? Well, isn't it better this way? There was no bloodshed. It was all your fault. My fault? I should have had him. But aren't you happier it worked out like this? There's no blood on your hands. But that's my job. It's your job to get blood on your hands? It's my job to kill tigers that terrorize the countryside. You threw such a scare into him, I don't think he'll be in the mood to terrorize anyone for a long, long time. Miss Louise... I... I... Yes? Nothing. Nothing at all. Bahadur Khan, carry the rifles. We're going home. I must say that the journey home was not a happy one. Foster Sahib was angry, and the Mem Sahib Louise did not know why. After a while, she too became angry, and so they spoke not a word to each other. When they arrived at the house, the Mim Sahib Pamela called me to her. Bahadur Khan, I have here a note which informs me that the children of my servants have not been vaccinated against the smallpox. What's happened? The people no longer believe in devils, and it has been believed that the vaccination is the magic that enters the blood to vanquish the devil of the smallpox. The Sahiba Louise has insisted to all that there are no devils. And in that case, of what use is the vaccination? I see. Thank you, Bahada Khan. That will be all. But that was not to be all. Foster Sahib was very unhappy at home, and therefore Mem Sahib Pamela was unhappy, and Mem Sahib Louise, she too was unhappy. Indeed, it was a most unhappy household. And then one morning, before he left for his office, Foster Sahib stopped to speak with his sister. Where's Louise? I believe she's out somewhere. Hmm. What trouble is she causing now? I think she's teaching some of the children to read. Yes, well. I thought you two would get along. Oh, I can't imagine why. You're so alike in so many ways. None of which is apparent to me. I, uh, I suppose you'd like to see her go. 
I know she's your oldest friend. She's not old. The fact is, she is so obviously out of place here. Well, and yet I, I, I can't ask her to leave, can I? No, I suppose not. Well, what's to be done? Leave it to me. Leave what to you? There are ways of getting around things. Now, Willis, Willis, you must not be cruel. No, dear. But I shall be surgical. Well, good morning, ladies. Good morning, good morning Willis. Well, everyone's so bright and early for breakfast. You seem to be in excellent spirit. Ladies, I am drunk. <laughs> Willis, you never drink this early in the morning. Oh, this is the greatest intoxication of all. What is? The glow, the exhilaration that has nothing to do with alcohol. What does it have to do with? Love. Love? Love? Ladies, you shall be the first to know. I am in love. Willis! At last, the steadfast Willis has finally fallen, taken prisoner by two sparkling blue eyes, a halo of golden blonde hair, and lips as luscious as the Kabuli grapes. I am her captive without hope of quarter. Uh, whose captive are you, Willis? I saw her last night at the club. And suddenly, what can I say? I... I was smitten. By whom, Willis? By Jenny Thorpe. Uh, Jenny, Jenny Thorpe? Jenny Thorpe. You... Uh, uh, Jenny, uh, she's a... Uh, she's what... an angel. Uh, she's a... Uh, she's already buried two husbands. Well, let her bury me, too, if it comes to that. Are you sure, Willis? When the heart speaks, can there ever be doubt? I... I wish you the best fortune, Willis. May you always be happy. Thank you, Louise. Um, you must excuse me. I, I, I think I have a headache. You can't be serious, Willis. That impossible Jenny Thorpe. I shall be serious for as long as it may be necessary. I don't understand. For as long as Louise remains here. Oh, well, it isn't necessary to hurt her. Oh, Pamela, dear, there is no such thing as painless surgery. All this was taking place even as I, Bahadur Khan, was serving the tea, the eggs, and the mutton chops for the breakfast. Later in the morning, as I proceeded to clean the bedrooms, I noticed the door of the Mem Sahib Louise was closed, and from within, the sound of a woman weeping. I was about to go away, but suddenly her door opened and the sahiba appeared before me. Obviously, she had hastily dried her tears. Bahadur Khan, may I speak with you? This insignificant person would be willing to spend eternity listening to the words of wisdom from the presence. Please, Bahadur Khan, I'm serious. I'm so miserable. You see... I've always been in love with Willis all my life. He'd never look at me. And now, now he's going to marry someone else. <laughs> Is it not written, there are other fish in the sea? Fish? Yes. Men, no. Oh, Bahadur Khan, perhaps, perhaps I offended that god. What was his name? Omir or something. That is when I refused that charm that you offered me. Now I'm willing to believe anything. I mean it. What have I got to lose? And this is such a strange country. Who knows what can happen here? I looked at this Mim Sahib who was fighting her tears. A strange country? No. This is not a strange country. It is really quite simple. It is the English who are strange. And this one, not only strange, but also ill. And why was she ill? Only because no one had ever led her to the nuptial couch. Which is why she was always getting herself into so much mischief. And yet, she would make an excellent wife for Foster Sahib. Ah, 
these English. Why are we always compelled to arrange matters for them? If the Sahib uh, will deign to listen. Oh, yes. You have grievously offended the great love god, Omira, when you insulted his charm. But I'm sorry. Omira is a god of love. He can always be appeased. He can? How? One must go to his temple and pray to him. Are you asking me to pray to a heathen god? The Sahiba has honored me by inquiring if I would serve her. If she continues to insult the mighty Omir... No, 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 uh, no, no, I certainly don't. No, not at all. Then we must go to the temple of Omira at midnight. At... at midnight? Yes, at midnight. At which time we shall pray to the love god for a miracle. Yes, one must always pray for a miracle. And in addition, one must always prepare for a miracle. After all, these things cannot be spun from the air, can they? And so, to begin, I went to the kitchen and spoke to Laila, the cook. Why should I help the Sahiba, Louis? Because I ask it of thee. I do not like the Sahiba. If thou refuse me, I shall tell thy husband about that British soldier in the bazaar. He has already beat me for the soldier. And the Bengali merchant. Also for the merchant. And for the Afghan horse trader. Ah. <laughs> uh, what is a... Uh... Required of me? Bring the paint, the powder, the rouge, which thou knowest so well to apply. Also, thy wedding gown. My wedding gown? Ah, yes. A most exciting garment. We must prepare the Sahiba Louise for her encounter with the love god of Omira. At midnight, we shall meet at his shrine. And so, at midnight, we met at the shrine of the love god. It was a bower of dogwood trees in full bloom, a few feet from the house. And why not? Any lovely place may be sacred to the god of love. At first, I did not recognize the Sahiba Louise. Laila had performed magic with her paint and her gown. Standing in front of me was a magnificent, stately goddess with skin like alabaster, flaming red hair, flashing eyes. I tell you, she was one to inflame the senses of any man. And so I approached Sahiba Louise, are you now ready to pray to the love god, Amira? I... I'm ready. Then speak. Speak of what is in your heart. Ask for the fulfillment of your desire. I... I want... Willis Foster. I want... Willis... Foster. Listen... Listen to the reply of the love god, Omira. I, I... I don't hear any... Close your eyes and listen. Listen. Yes. My child, I have heard your prayer. I grant your wish. I fulfill your desire. You shall have Willis Foster. Go to him. Go to him now. Tell him it is my will. Oh, but I... Do you believe in me, my daughter? Yes, but I... Then go to him now. Yes. Yes. Like one in a dream, she turned, she walked into the house... 
She went to the room of Foster Sahib, and I heard... Oh, what, what, what time is it? You... Oh, who... who are you? You don't know me. Louise? No, oh, it, it... You can't be Louise. I'm Louise. But you're... You're beautiful. Why have we kept apart from each other for so many years? No, that you ask me, I... I don't know. Even as children, we knew we were meant for each other. Why did we fight against it? I guess you thought I was dull. And did you think I was too clever? Well, <laughs> I'm not really clever. No, and I'm not really dull either. What is this nonsense about that awful Jenny Thorpe? Well, that's, that's all it is, Louise. Nonsense. You were always too shy to say it, and I was too proud, but someone has to say it first. I love you. And, and I love you. Uh, just... Just a moment. Then he closed the door to his room, and I was able to hear no more. Like a good servant, I retired for the night, seeing that my master had need of me no longer. And you, to whom I tell this tale, have need of me no longer as well. For the rest of the story, you may supply yourselves. I will be back shortly with a final thought. Our story may perhaps a question, is there a God of love? Our meetings matings and matches all arranged in advance? I would answer most likely because some of the pairings and partnerships we see around us simply could not come about by themselves. Somebody, somewhere, somehow must have had a hand in it. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Kurt Benson, Grace Matthews, and William Griffiths. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams.